So I'm Dan Roth. I'm the executive editor of LinkedIn. Thank you all for coming today. It's great. It's a great crowd, and it's been great listening to what uh, folks have been talking about already. You know, we've heard a lot about what people are doing right with content, about IBM and Dow and some great case studies. What I really want to talk to you about is what people are doing wrong and the mistakes they're making. Um, readers and your customers love hearing about mistakes. And I'm going to talk to you about the lessons of, uh, that we've learned about how to harness the power of content and turn them into conversations. One of the ways is through talking about problems that you've seen or mistakes you've had. There's a lot of other things to talk about also, but that's one of them. So at LinkedIn, I work on all of our original content and any of our aggregated content as well. Um, I've spent my career in business journalism. I was, a, I was the editor of Fortune.com before joining LinkedIn. I was a longtime editor and writer. Uh, I was a senior editor at Fortune, helped start a magazine at Condé Nast called Portfolio. And before that, I was at Forbes and, um, and uh, a little paper called the Triangle Business Journal in Raleigh, which I'm sure you all subscribe to. Um, the, my whole life was spent really thinking about how to get professional content in front of professionals. LinkedIn uh, was, when we started moving into content, it was a clear example of how to use, how to get uh, really incredible business content in front of the largest collection of professionals ever assembled. So I've written or assigned many stories that I love and that I'm really proud of. Um, the one I want to talk to you about today is one that kind of fell, fell in my lap um, through running the influencer program, which we'll go into in a little bit. This was a piece written by Beth Comstock. Many of you might know Beth. I don't know if you do or not. She's the CMO of GE. Um, Beth was the, before she was the CMO of GE, she was the head of PR at NBC. And she was someone who was incredibly efficient. Beth, in her own words, got things done. Uh, she really would say she got shit done. She was someone who, when you talked to Beth, she had a to-do list. She would write it all down. She'd have the check marks ready to go. And by the end of the day, every single thing that you told Beth that she needed to work on or that she thought you needed to work on, it was checked off. She would make sure everyone was assigned, and her day was totally complete. So one day, Beth was, uh, she gotten promoted. She was talking to her new boss, Jack Welch. And she was on the phone with Jack, and suddenly the line went dead. So Beth picks up the phone, dials again, gets Jack's assistant, and says, get disconnected. And the assistant says, you didn't get disconnected. Jack hung up on you. <laughs> and he said, she, the assistant said, uh, Jack did this because he wanted you to know what it's like to be in a meeting with you. So Beth's kind of stunned by this. This is her new boss. <laughs> and she goes to go talk to Jack, and Jack Welch says to her, you are too abrupt. You are too good at getting things done. You aren't listening to what people are saying. You're only listening to what they've said. You don't understand what their motivation is. You're not helping them get to the next level. You're not thinking about how you can come together. You're not advancing what they're saying. You are all about getting things done. You're incredibly abrupt. You have to sit with the information, and you have to wallow in it. This term was you have to wallow in it. So Beth really, it completely changed Beth's mindset. It could change her career also. Now, I love this story for two reasons. Number one, I love it because she wrote it for LinkedIn. Uh, but number two is I think it talks about how you play in the content game. You have to be prepared to allow people to wallow in what you're giving them. You have to know where you think you're taking things, but not know where it's going to go. I don't have to tell any of you that content, and clearly if you're here at this conference, you know this is true, that content is an immensely valuable currency for brands, for individuals, um, for it's a powerful tool for any business or any person trying to reach a certain set of customers or trying to even talk to their own employees. If you want to establish yourself, and I hate this term, but I can't think of a better one yet, if you want to establish yourself as a thought leader, content is the way that you do it. You do it through a lot of writing, and there's so much clutter out there that you have to be doing this. Um, some of the stats show that this is also true. We've seen 39% of marketing spend is now on branded content. That's an incredible number. And there's some amazing examples of that, of which the Dow uh, example is a really good one. But also, you look at Amex, um, what is it called? Amex on stage, the Red Bull Stratos product, uh, project, I would consider that to be content. It certainly was a stunt surrounded by a lot of great content. But content isn't easy. Um, in an era where we increasingly expect the wonders of big data, to tell us what our customers want and where we should go and give us the answers that we need. Content is an incredibly messy game. Um, you have to put ideas out there and not know what's going to happen. You have to sit with them. You have to know what it is you're trying to say, but be prepared for the idea that someone might take it in an entirely different, different direction than where you thought it should go. 
You have to be prepared for outcomes to be out of your control, and that's difficult, I think, for a lot of people. So you are creating, essentially, a conversation. It's like going to a party and starting to talk about something, and someone takes it from there, and you don't know where at all people are going to go with exactly what you've, you've introduced yourself, and then you're waiting to see where do we go next. Um, I think only now are brands and executives learning how to harness this power. And those who do stand to gain a transformational uh, change in their business. So let me tell you a little bit about how LinkedIn uh, plays in this, uh, in this game. Let's see here. So as Jonathan was saying, um, we really started with the idea of being a professional network. That is what LinkedIn was all about. More and more of the business to business conversation or professionally related content is flowing through LinkedIn. It's really not how we started. We started with the idea that we were going to help you connect with your network. We were going to let you form a network that would tell you everyone you know that you needed to know. For the last two years, we've really been, we've layered on something else. We've layered on the idea of how do you connect the world's professionals with the insights that matter to them? What are the stories, ideas, conversations, uh, discussions that they need to know or need to be participating in to make them better at what they do or what they want to do? So how do we do this? Um, we do it through a couple ways. The first is LinkedIn Today. This is our original um, uh, product in this area, and this is when I joined, is right when we had launched LinkedIn Today. LinkedIn Today is our professional social news product. Many of you may have seen this. It's always at the top of your LinkedIn page. Um, we are always trying to get the right article to the right professionals at a massive scale. That's our slogan with LinkedIn Today, and we work every day to achieve that. We do it through a combination of man and machines, or editors and machines. Um, and that's our, our kind of our mantra at Contentland, is this can't all be done by humans, and it can't all be done by machines. And if you can find the right mixture of the two, then you win. The machine part looks a little like this. Uh, you might have seen this in share button on all of your favorite websites. It's on about 1.5 million websites right now. Anytime a, uh, a reader clicks on InShare to share an article with his or her network, we get all kinds of information because we know who you are. We know what your profile looks like. We know what your network looks like. And we're looking for um, information on who is doing it, who is sharing it, and why they might be sharing it. So if a banker starts sharing a story in Le Monde, and then we see that there's other bankers who have similar looking networks to this person in Le Monde, we might say this is a great story for people like Banker X or Banker Y. Um, we, you can imagine us slicing that not just by job titles or, or industries, but also by length of service, by a point in your career, what their network looks like, who you're connecting with, what else you're sharing. In, in essence, we're not looking for the uh, wisdom of the crowd. We're looking for the wisdom of your crowd. Now, what we're doing with that is creating an amazing filter. The human part of that is that we try to break the filter. We say, you know, you are not just a sum of your profile and of what you're sharing. You're much more than that. A banker also might be really interested in, in uh, you know, going to Burning Man and hearing what the latest things are going on with, uh, with the tech crowd. We want to make sure that we are exposing people to stories that are outside of what the algorithms tell us they're interested in. And we do that because, for a couple of reasons. Number one, it gives you, the professional, more information to share and to comment on. We're really focused on the idea of giving you the right stories that you can then share with your own networks, make, put your own perspective on, write your own content around. And we want you to also know when you go into a meeting that you've seen the headlines that, will, that people are going to be talking about. Or if you go to a party, it's the discussion that happened today that you saw on LinkedIn is exactly the discussion, excuse me, when I, I should say a party, I mean a work event, that, those, uh, that, the, that, the, uh, that the headlines you see are what people are going to be talking about that event. The result is a news product, and I can't remember if this is the next slide. The result is a news product that tells you what you need to know when you start your day and as you work your way through it. When we point uh, professionals at particular content, uh, at particular uh, publishers, we tend to melt servers. We send page views skyrocketing. Publishers really like working with us for this reason. So LinkedIn today launched nearly two years ago. And the natural evolution, what we did was we learned a lot about the data. We took all the data and we checked to see what people were sharing, what they were talking about, what they wanted to hear more about. But we had a sense that there was a lot more information out there that we could get to professionals. Um, we wanted to move from content aggregation to content curation. Excuse me, I shouldn't say move from one to the other. We wanted to add on the idea of content um, creation on top of the content uh, aggregation. So in October, October of last year, we did that debut in the LinkedIn Influencer Program. With Influencer, we set out to get some of the top thought leaders, uh, 
again, I hate to use that word, in business sharing what they're seeing every day. What are the uh, things that Meg Whitman hears when she's walking through the halls of HP? What are the, uh, what is the, the CEO of Cleveland Clinic experiencing when he talks to different hospital workers? What's the future of healthcare? What do these, how have these people gotten to the point in their career and what kind of insights can they share with the professionals around the world that will help them get on the same path to success? Remember, we spent most of our existence at LinkedIn connecting with you with the people you know, but what if there was all kinds of hidden information the people you will never get to know? So we went after some of the top names in business like Richard Branson, Ariana Huffington. We launched this right before the presidential election, so we reached out to um, Barack Obama and we got uh, Mitt Romney. It's actually a, a very funny story in the way that this whole thing works, which is that there's so much chicken and egg that, that went into the launch of this. So. We really worked hard on Romney. As soon as we had Romney, we had Obama, but you had to play them off each other for a little while. Anyways, they both came on the exact same day, which is great. We also deliberately went after people who were specialists in their own fields, who were really well-known uh, names in things like marketing, telecom, retail, media, uh, venture capital. Today, we have north of 300 influencers. We have everyone from the CEO of HP, as you can see, to the CEO of WPP, um, who just wrote a great post yesterday about the role of, uh, of, of make sure that you have not just creatives in the ad agency, but also that you, the importance of having data people in, in the ad industry. Um, we have the heads of BuzzFeed and of Burberry. Uh, just this week, in fact, just this week, we launched uh, Ban Ki-moon came on. This was the UN Secretary General's first social presence. Um, the CEO of Dow Jones, the CEO of AirAsia, who's fantastic, and uh, ad guru Steve Stout. Each of these people have written hundreds of posts. And what's amazing to me, especially coming from the traditional media world, is how much engagement there is around these posts. There is, on average, 100 comments on every influencer piece. There are 30,000 views on average and 240 likes. To put that in perspective, when I was at Fortune.com, if we had a dozen comments on a story, we were really excited. And if any of those didn't just say, I'm first, or you guys are conservative jerks or liberal jerks, whatever it was, then we were you know, thrilled beyond belief. Here we're getting real people commenting with their own identities and explaining why they are, why the, the, the content they just read worked for them or didn't work for them. Now, why do the influencers join? It's because of the context. And, 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 uh, and Jonathan mentioned this a little bit. LinkedIn is a professional network. When people come here, it's for professional reasons. They aren't sharing cat videos. We've never had a Kim Kardashian story show up in LinkedIn today. This is about the professional world. Uh, when Meg Whitman wanted to explain where she was going to take HP, she did it on LinkedIn. This was the place where she posted her roadmap for HP. And she did it because, number one, it's a professional network. She knew there was no one going to say, why am I reading this? It's under, you understand why you're getting it on LinkedIn. Number two, she could reach about 95% of her employees by doing it on LinkedIn. And she could reach many partners. She could reach all of her investors. She could reach the entire world of HP in a way that she couldn't if she had just posted it on her blog or sent it as an in-company email. Um, people come to LinkedIn for business, and that's what she was counting on. Many of the people on LinkedIn also, it's the, many of the influencers have more followers here than they have on any other social network. And the feedback the professional get, world is giving them, they use to create content across, uh, across every platform, whether it gives them ideas for what to do on Pinterest, on their own blogs, on their own sites. They use this as a sounding board. And while I'm a big believer, as you can probably tell from my history, in the power of the written word, sometimes the video can uh, do an even better job. So here's a little video about what we're creating.
So speaking of living large, uh, Richard Branson is a great, you saw him in the video, he's our top performing influencer. He is, uh, in, every time that he writes, people just share like crazy. Uh, his first nine posts, in fact, generated more than 2.4 million views. He has about 2.5 million followers. Um, but there are others who are less well known, who aren't rock stars in the business world, who are also doing incredibly well. And this will get to the point of what kind of content works and how you create it. Um, the, my favorite example here is Glenn Kelman. Glenn Kelman, I don't know if many of you know him, he's the CEO of, uh, of Redfin, which is a uh, online broker, a housing broker in, it's based in Seattle. His first, he had nearly half a million views for his first six posts, uh, the first of which was titled, The Best Advice I Ever Got, I Learned from a Sex-Crazed Short Order Cook. And the latest, the last one was about um, nearly getting fired from his startup and his experience being in front of the chairman and crying and trying to beg to, to not lose his job. Um, you know, I talked about the need to expose yourself a little bit. Glenn Kelman is doing just that and the community is responding. What's interesting is that Glenn talks about the power this has had on, his, on himself and on his company. There's a halo effect that's created when you humanize yourself, when you, when you show uh, some of the warts, when you explain the problems that you've had. Glenn has had uh, people that he's had competitors, he's had regulators, he's had people that he's had tense conversations with in the past, reach out to him and say, I was really moved by what you wrote, made me think. He wrote a post about uh, the commencement address he wished he had given. We asked the influencers once a month to write about specific content. One was about commencement addresses. And he said he got a call from a, um, a regulator who said, I've read the entire thing to my son, it really moved me. He said he'd only had bad conversations with this guy before. Now this guy was reacting to him as a human and not just seeing him as a antagonist. So what Branson and Kelman have in common is that they both understand the power of the words to start a conversation, how to do it and why it's important. And they're not just afraid to jump in and see what happens. Neither CEO writes as if his content was created by a committee. You would never mistake what they're writing as a press release. Uh, they talk about, again, about mistakes and warts and mishaps. They don't pretend to have all the answers. I think that's really important. And readers don't feel like they're being manipulated through tricks of social media or through hooks that are designed to bring them in. They feel like they are getting to understand a real person. There's an authenticity that shines through. And I think what's going on here is the content is really the ultimate icebreaker. It gives people a chance to talk about something. It sets the wheels in motion. The reason why people pour in, again, there's a, on average 100 comments on every post. The reason why they comment on these posts is because they're giving their own spin on what the professionals have just talked about. And they're doing it to shape their own identities. You know, earlier I said that, that creating content is hard. That's incredibly true. That's true for me as a professional writer. I once was working on a story about eBay, and I spent, this, I had five days to do the story. I spent the first four days working on the first three paragraphs. Um, this is for an 8,000 word story. You can imagine how excited my editors were to read the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the content. It was terrible. The, uh, the, it's writing is, is incredibly hard. It is difficult to create anything. You write one sentence, and the second sentence isn't created out of that first sentence. What's not, what is easy is critiquing. It's very easy to read something else, that's something that someone has said, and to put your own spin on it, to give your own two cents, to explain why you think that what they've said is right or wrong, or how, well, what you've seen in your own career, uh, you can give your own take on what the influencer has just presented. Now, in this case, on LinkedIn, this is the way it works. The influencers create, and the 238 million professionals take it from there. It's not just influencers, we have over one million groups. When you look at the data, it's fascinating to see how many uh, group discussions are started with an article that someone is sharing into the group. And I think they do that because uh, there's two reasons. Number one, again, creating content is difficult. But number two, you don't always want to put your opinion out there. If you could take someone else's opinion and, uh, and, and give it slightly as your own, you know, someone, Richard Branson says something and you say, you give the hedge like, I thought this was interesting, quote, here's Richard Branson saying it. You're identifying yourself, your, yourself with what he's saying, but you're also giving yourself an out. And this is important in the professional content, in the professional context, which is you want to stand up, but you also want to be able to hide when you need to. Uh, it's a phenomenon we've seen, uh, we've seen how many new discussions are created by someone just sharing. So people just share links all the time and they, and they brand themselves with it. If your content isn't doing this, if your content isn't creating conversations, then I think you're doing it wrong. 
we've come to understand that the journey of a story or a piece of content doesn't end when it reaches the person whom our algorithm or who you think your clients are. When you get that, that article to somebody, that is not the end. That cannot be the end of the story. It's got to continue beyond that. It, it, only makes, it only has currency when it is carried forward. When that person uses that piece of content and says, hey, this is me. I'm interested in what Richard Branson said or someone else said or what Dow said or whoever it was that said it. And here's my own spin on it. And you pass it on and your network passes it on and your network passes it on. And the conversation is created. And you as the content creator just started it. You get the halo effect of having started it, but you don't know where the conversation is going. And that's a really good thing. The idea that the value of content increases the more it's shared is something we're already accustomed to. I'm sure all of you have you know, been to parties or been to events and you don't know what to talk to about someone. So you say, hey, did you see the news that BlackBerry just got acquired by, or just went private for $4.7 billion? That's crazy. I you know, got my first BlackBerry, whatever. You start talking about an article or a news event or a piece of content as a way to break the ice with somebody. I have an uncle, by the way, who is a hoarder. Who, has, who collects uh, newspapers. He's, he has subscriptions to four newspapers and about a dozen magazines. He stores them all over his house. In fact, when you go to his house, you have the beds. The legs have been taken off the bed, and they're just newspapers holding up, holding up the beds. And he, is, he takes the newspapers, and he clips through them. He's up to about 2001 now. And he sends those articles to nephews and to friends and to colleagues. <laughs> And he says, I thought of you. This made me think, what do you think about this? This is a, he is not exactly in the digital age yet, but this is what's happening all the time. There are uh, tens of millions, if not billions, of Uncle Larry's out there who are now using this content as a way to start conversations. The mistake that I think a lot of people make is that they believe that their work isn't ready to be shared until it's complete. That until they know the ending, until they know exactly how it's going to be formed, that they cannot, that they can't share it out there. Until it's tied in the neat bow, and certainly as a writer, uh, I've had that experience. Until you know what the final great ending is to your story, you don't want it out there. I think those days are dead, and it's it's important to realize that no matter what kind of content you're creating, you need to start the conversation. And even if it's raw, it's better than um, than not having it out there at all. We have a, there's a term that's used obviously all over Silicon Valley, the, the idea of the minimally viable product. You don't, when you launch a new product, you want to have it out onto the web uh, or on the mobile, whatever it is, when you're slightly embarrassed about it. If you're putting it up there um, when you're really proud of it and you think it's complete, then you've waited too long. You should have it up and you should, let, you should see what your users are going to do with it. You don't know where things are going to go. I think the exact same thing is true of content. Be ready with a minimally viable product, post it up there, and then be prepared for it to spread. Make sure it's going to spread, but also don't worry so much about it being the perfect thing. Richard Branson recently wrote a piece, to go back to Branson, that generated more than 250,000 page views, 6,700 likes, 3,000 tweets, and 3,700 comments. But the piece was only 200 words wrong, uh, long. It was, what's the best measure of success happiness, was the headline. It was a little riff about Bhutan and how Bhutan is measuring happiness and how he measures happiness. And uh, you know, money isn't the way he measures it, which is, of course, an easy thing to say when you're Richard Branson. Um, but the, the network lit up. There were 18 comments for every word that Branson wrote because he said something that people wanted to engage with. They wanted to share with their network, and they wanted to brand themselves with it. So why does this happen on LinkedIn more than it ever happened at Fortune or elsewhere? Um, one of the reasons is because there is no anonymity on LinkedIn. We have no trolling. We have no, uh, no flame wars that go on. Every time someone writes, whatever they write is, uh, is, is seen as part of their professional identity. Their boss sees it. Their employees see it. Uh, their future business partners see it. So people really think about what, what it is they want to say. The slide always kills me because the, you know, how would you like to be Jamie Alexander, who we've said is similar to a troll? Um, <laughs> The, uh, this is as close as you can get to having a permanent record. Uh, this is the permanent professional record. I've talked to a lot of brands and companies who are interested in building microsites and who want to have the content live on their own site. And they build these things, and they then are stunned that people won't come to it. Um, and I think part of the problem is that, number one, you want to be where the conversation is happening. People are coming to LinkedIn every day, so they come here for the, they, they, they are already here and you can capture them. Number two, their identities are tied to LinkedIn. 
and, and you can't, and they, when they are commenting, they're doing it on purpose because they want their entire networks to see what they're saying. They're actually not talking to the influencers. One of the things that we didn't realize when we launched this is we were really nervous about how much would the influencers get into the comments and respond. It turns out that the commenters don't really care at all if the influencers ever come in and respond because when they're leaving a comment, they're, are, they are talking to their networks, not to the influencer. Again, the influencer is a conversation starter. Uh, so when people do this, they are, they're starting a snowball. Do you agree? Do you have a different point of view? Can you use your opinion to build up your own expertise and credibility? Commenting, I think, is the new, uh, is the new commentary. And audiences increasingly see it as a viable measure of the credibility of, of that piece of content. If you go to a YouTube video, if you go to a, an article, and you don't see any comments below it, if there's no social cues that tell you that other people like it, there is an immediate distrust that happens. Wait, why, I think I like this, but no one else does. Maybe I shouldn't like this piece of content. The conversation that happens below or within or next to a piece of content is as important, if not more important, than the original content that started it off. The writer's opinion no longer feels complete on its own. It has to have that community building off of it. This involves quite a big mind shift for writers and for brands. You have to give over ownership of the direction and the conclusion of a piece of content. And I think this is, really is a hard thing to wrestle with. I understand this is not easy to say, I don't know where this is going to go. I'm not sure what's going to happen. This isn't really pretty. You have to circulate it within your company. There's 40 people that have to sign off on every piece of content. By the time it shows up, it's been totally denuded of any voice. It's been stripped of any authenticity. It feels completely safe. This is a huge mistake. When you're playing it safe, someone else isn't. And when they're not playing it safe, that is what people are sharing. So I mean, you don't want to be, you want to be somewhat safe, but you, what you don't want to do is be too safe. Um, and so that's what really creating content is all about, I think. You don't want to let people just check off the box and say, I've read this. I've seen it. It showed up in my feed. You want people to take the piece of content and put their own spin on it. Let it live with their own worlds. As Jack Welch said, you want people to wallow with the content.